This episode is brought to you by La Quinta, by Wyndham. Wherever your work takes you, you know it's going to be a good time because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. They have free breakfast, fully equipped gyms, and free high-speed Wi-Fi to help you take care of any last-minute business or help keep you in the know on all things sports. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you triumph. Book your stay today at LQ.com. Sports Social, now on the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hi there, I'm Toby Tarrant from Zero Ducks Given, and you can find more cricket podcasts than you can shake a stump at, all on the Sports Social Podcast Network, including ours, where I'm joined by grumpy former England fast bowler Stephen Finn, test match special commentator Daniel Norcross, and also sometimes by Finney's cat Ethel. Sometimes we talk about cricket, most of the time we talk about anything else. Just search Zero Ducks Given wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. It is late at night at Wimbledon. We have had our first curfew suspended evening of the championships. Uh, I'm here with my eye colleague, Michael Hinks, who you will have heard from before, um, from Labour Cup fame, as I suppose I might call you accurately, Mike, the, the glory days of the Roger Federer retirement party. Uh, we've had quite a party here at Wimbledon today as well. Um, where we've just stepped off the grounds to record this uh, late night daily podcast. It was day four, I think. Yeah, yeah. Hard to keep up with exactly what day it was. Uh, we had Liam Brody, we had Elena Rybakina, we had, of course, Andy Murray. And that really seems like the only place to start, Mike, where a few minutes ago, Andy Murray went down yelping behind the baseline on set point. I mean, I actually think... I had a genuine visceral reaction of my, my head, my hands going to my head because of the, oh my God, has this really happened? I mean, what did is he injured? I mean, it was set point as well, wasn't it? So yeah. I think the focus was on potentially that being the last point and all of a sudden he's down and the a cry of new balls, please, from the crowd certainly didn't help. <laughs> as, um, you don't do that to Sir Andrew Baron murray um, <laughs> No, it was it, like you said. It was a yelp. I think we saw Elise Cornet go down earlier towards the back of the court as well. But I think Murray's looking at replays definitely looked it looked a bit more potentially concerning, and he'll certainly be stiff when he goes back out on centre court tomorrow as well. And that's the thing, isn't it? Like, it, who is this worse for? Because the referee Jerry Armstrong came out and looked like he had a word with both players. It seemed. I had headphones on, but I couldn't hear what he said. It seemed like, and JJ on the BBC blog was suggesting that Murray actually wanted to play on, which I thought was quite interesting. I, I think probably, as an old man myself, um, if that had happened to me, I think that's only going to be worse in the morning. Like, isn't it that like even if it's just cramp, which is what I think it is, but it could be worse. It's like that's only going to be worse tomorrow morning, whenever it is they come back. We haven't yet had confirmed exactly when that's going to be. I'm just looking to see if there is an email from the referee's office, but I haven't seen anything yet, so we're not sure. But we think we're going to get Murray resuming on centre court tomorrow in what is a jam-packed schedule, and we will come on to that. Um, Do you think Murray... I mean, he he lost the first set in a tie-break. It was a very serve-dominated set. He won the second and then broke immediately in the third do you think he had sits past his number? Did he play well? I mean, it started off quite slow. I mean, I don't think Murray really had the power in the first set. And maybe, even though it started just before 8pm, I think maybe it was like, oh, this probably won't reach the 11pm curfew because it might be Stefanos in three. But I don't know. He, he does it every time. We, we kind of expected at the moment that the Wimbledon draw came out, that it would be this sort of match under the lights on a Wednesday or Thursday. And he just pulls it out of the bag. And I... Maybe of, of all the top eight players that he would want to face in this scenario, maybe Sissipas is is the player out of all of them. And um, yeah, like you said, would he have wanted to have played on for 20 more minutes if it wasn't for the injury? If it is an injury, who knows? But what we do know is that the roof will probably should be open again tomorrow and that will, that will probably suit him again. You'd think so. I mean, when the roof was shut, my my thought was that actually that that maybe does suit Murray because it'll slow conditions down. You know, Sitspass is a bigger hitter. I mean, Christ, Sitspass served so big in the first set, and a forehand was firing. And you know, then the second, basically the second set, the difference was Murray was able to get at the backhand, and like bloody hell, that number five in the world, and the backhand is that rubbish. Like it's it's genuinely ridiculous how rubbish his backhand is. Like, there were at least like 
four shanks like beyond the baseline or like there was one that you just framed into the floor that I couldn't quite believe um, and actually it's funny when you said Sid's Pass is probably the one top eight player he'd want to play I think probably the exception to that is Casper Rude yep. um, not for his bottling ability but for <laughs> his grass court ability and I think probably when Liam Brody saw that he was going to play Casper Rude I think he would have thought this is so winnable and so it proved five sets six four Three six four six six three six love um, of the three regular podcasters. Only Calvin actually put money where his mouth is and predicted that Brody would indeed go and beat Rude. Uh, George and I both thought that it might just be a bridge too far. Cal- uh, Mike, you were on Brody duty. I mean, it was a, it, it, just a great performance, wasn't it? Like you just didn't ever really seem to get nervous, which is what I thought would happen. Yeah, no, it was. It was just a great, great fun to watch, and I think he kind of went in with that nothing to lose mentality but I think it kind of helped especially against a player that like Brody has been further at Wimbledon than Rude and that properly showed um, I think yeah laughed at a few comments I think Rosetsky saying Rude looked like a yeah, deer in the headlights looked confused and I think Brody sensed that even though yeah I mean even though Rude managed to fight back and make it two sets to one he just never looked comfortable out there and I think Brody lapped it up he he said this is the moments he plays tennis for. Like, you want to play against the world number four, you want to play against his top players, and yeah, he's only played on centre court once before, but he really he really looked comfortable out there. I think that is the thing as well. Like, I was saying it a couple of times to people watching the match, like, looking at Liam Brody's game, like, he doesn't really have anything. Like, you're like, oh, what? how does Liam Brody win matches? And it's like, well, it just sort of does. Like, he's left-handed, which, as you know, is cheating in tennis. Um, he's he's scrappy. His, tell you what, his backhand is weirdly Cam Norrie-like. Like, the kind of stiff-armed, straight-armed backhand. It's quite flat. It sort of zips through the court. The forehand's decent, but he's so competitive. He's got really nice, like, hands. Like, I thought he came forward quite well at the right times. And, as you say, like, Rude just never really looked comfortable, which, you know... He's barely played on grass, like, of course. And it does feel like Casper Ruud has taken this, and I hope this doesn't happen more, I feel like he's taken this attitude where it's like, I'm going to play on clay for like two, three months before the French Open, I'm then going to have a couple of weeks off, I'm going to come to Wimbledon, hit for five days, you know, have a go, and then go back onto the clay. Because he'll now go and play like Gestad or Bestad or Umstad <laughs> or wherever it happens to be. And then he'll go to hardcore, and it's like, well... I really hope that doesn't become a theme. I, I think probably the, like, the prize money and the, the ranking points are probably too much to ignore. Um, like, you know, if you take someone like, I don't know, even like Stefano Sitsipas, like who picks up a lot of grass court points because he, he plays quite well, um, I think that probably is, is worthwhile. It's worth also mentioning that the slip that you mentioned, Mike, like Sitsipas had a couple of slips. Um, Corne had a really bad slip. Like, it looked... I couldn't believe she carried on. Like, her knee, like, was basically just... She's already held together with tape, but, like, deep behind the baseline. I guess it's just what happens, like, in the first week of Wimbledon. I, I know you have good sources in the, the grounds team who think the players just forget how to walk on grass, right? <laughs> well, yeah, and I think... Yeah, and said, said ground staff member would probably point out towards the back of the court, like, especially it's... When these players are going really far back to defend, and that is actually quite often where these slips occur. If you see where Cornet fell, especially, like, I'm pretty sure it, it was pretty far back. So, you know, yeah, you can. It's it's grass. It's a slippery surface. It's naturally slippy, and we've seen it. We have seen it time and time again, and it's not as controversial maybe as it was a few years ago. And I know Serena made a bit more of a song and dance about it back then. But yeah, grass is grass, and I think you have to prepare for it. And Yep, let's see how Murray fares tomorrow. I like what uh, Venus said something quite similar, really, where she was like, it's like it's an inherently slippery surface. Like, y- you know, you're going to fall over on it sometimes. And she was obviously gutted to, to have done her knee on it, basically. But it does happen. Um, I wonder if there are any other results, maybe, that you wanted to, to note, Mike, from around the grounds. The, the Vekic Stevens match, incidentally, on number one, I watched the last set of, and it was a brilliant match. Um, Stevens got within two points of winning it. Um, but uh, then Donna Vekic fought back. She served brilliantly in the final set, um, showed tremendous nerve to kind of keep it going. I suppose we should mention Alina Svetolina, who, who is through, and it, I think I'm right in saying into a really open bit of the draw. Like, there's absolutely no reason that someone like her couldn't go and, like, and do real damage. Like, she's someone who... She's playing Sphere Kennan, of course, tomorrow on what we're calling Freaky Friday because it's going to be 
like just the most insane day. Um, I mean, it, I don't know how far Alina Sotelier. I'm just trying to work out what half she's in, but um, she does f- strike me as someone who maybe she wasn't always like this. Like I think people would always consider her a bit of a Grand Slam bottler, but I don't know. She's been away. She's had a kid. Like her country's been invaded. She's started a foundation, and I don't know. Like that change. All of those things change you in a way. And I wonder if, like, that added perspective of just being like, this is not the most important thing. I wonder if that can't make a difference to someone and and maybe give someone an opportunity to go deep at a Grand Slam. Have you got a drawer in front of you, Mike? Have you worked out where she is? Yeah, no, and I do think I do think priorities change, and I do think that as 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 you get older, your your perspective can change, and you can certainly see things in a different light. And yeah, if. For Alina having a reputation as perhaps a bottler at Grand Slams before, it's probably no bad thing that she probably has gone away. She's had a kid and she has realised when she's come back and it's looking like that. She's playing more free and I think that helps and a mentality switch can only help. But that's a bit of a um, filibuster for the draw where we have, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, Kasatkina or Azarenka next for the winner of Alina or Kenyon. So it's I mean, that's, that's winnable. They're all like... winnable. Like, um, and, then, and then she goes into the top bit with, so with Iga Shante, right? waiting in the quarterfinals, we would assume. I mean, that'd be great. Like, Shontek Sitalina in a quarter, I think. I mean, there's a few. Shontek Azarenka would also have a few storylines to it, which would be nice. I mean, Shontek Kenin as well. If she continues, what is her great run? Um, there's a lot going on there. Uh, we should briefly just look ahead to tomorrow. As we mentioned, it, it's going to be a wild day. Uh, it's just been confirmed that Andy Murray is a not before 3 p.m. second on centre court. I mean, that does mean he potentially has to play again on Saturday. Yeah. I guess it, it, whoever wins that match will get a late start on Saturday. But Carlos Alcaraz, Alexandra Muller is first on. I mean, that will be straightforward. Uh, famous last words, but Alcaraz is going to win that in straight sets. Um, Iga Shronte against Petra Martic will follow Murray versus Sitsipas and then the kind of the jewel in the uh, crown of centre court tomorrow is, is Vavrinka Djokovic I mean Mike I feel like you're someone who is a natural Vavrinka fan because you're also like a federati so <laughs> like it comes from an era when you probably fell in love with tennis when he was going and winning grand slams it's just great to have him back in a big match, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think and what was great about his Grand Slam triumphs were just how much more unexpected they were. Like, especially in that era, we look back on Murray being a three-time winner. So is Warinka, and he's just a great player to have and a great character to have still at 38 playing. And if you, yeah, go find some quotes on what he said about Djokovic today, just because he was just like, have you seen him play? When he was <laughs> basically asked about whether I can, whether he can beat him and... He was just like, he said he has zero chance to win Wimbledon. And he just he said he doesn't really stand a chance against Djokovic. But you've got to love the honesty and you've got to love, the, yeah, maybe just the nonchalance of someone who's been there, done that, doesn't really care if he doesn't win tomorrow. But he's playing Djokovic on centre and I'm sure he'll give it a good go. Probably in three for Djokovic, but who knows? Yeah, and, and to be honest, if it's not in three for Djokovic, it's going to be a real problem because those matches won't start. Incredibly, centre court will still start at one thirty, which remains the stupidest thing about all of this. Um, if you've got number one tickets tomorrow as well, there's plenty going on. On Stubur against Bai of China, Cam Norrie against Christopher Eubanks, which for people who haven't seen Christopher Eubanks play before or heard him talk, he is both a really good player and a really good talker. Um, I know I was talking to someone at the Tennis Channel the other day and Eubanks has actually been doing a lot of commentary for them even though he's only 27 he's not winding his career up but he just enjoys doing it and he says it makes him think about his game in a really different way because he spent time analysing players in the commentary box um, the other game match that has to resume tomorrow well there's a couple actually but the other big one is Medvedev against Manorino <laughs> Medvedev was so angry to get suspended at four all in the third already two sets up just because it means he now has to come back and like warm up in the morning and then play a match and then cool down and then he has to come back on Saturday and play a match and then cool down so it's a lot and then we should mention Liam Brody's back tomorrow as well playing Denis Shapovalov um, I I think it'll be too much for Brody personally uh, I think there are others on the podcast who think similarly Um, I will put it as one of our predictions for day five and we'll see if anyone puts their money where their mouth is. That was myself and the esteemed Michael Hinks, uh, one of my colleagues at the Eye, talking about today's play at Wimbledon. 
The next voice you're going to hear, well, it might be me again, but you're also going to hear a little bit from Denis Shapovalov. Your memories of playing Murray here as well, it was obviously, I remember the, the atmosphere was something else. Like, do you relish it even when that atmosphere is against you? Do you enjoy that? And, and what, what, what do you kind of think when you look back on that match? Yeah, I do. I mean, I don't think the crowd was like, obviously they were in for me, but I don't think they were necessarily against me. I remember like they're, they were pretty nice and applauding for, for both players when there was good points and stuff like that. So that's, that's always nicer than like, if you're getting booed at or, or if, you know, or if they're just distracting you during the match. So I think, you know, it's nice to have a respectful crowd. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, for me, it was a lot of fun to, to play on center court. I think it's the, the most prestigious stadium or center court in our sport. So to have a chance to, to be out there was, was extremely special. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I was obviously playing incredible to, to beat a guy like Andy in straight sets um, on grass out of all surfaces. It's, it's not easy to do. So I was definitely playing great and enjoying that moment. And, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that's, that I do cherish. And, uh, yeah, I, I loved everything about it. Even, even the roof closing, you know, after the second set, I thought it was super cool to, to kind of be – um, in a match where, you know, you play two sets and then, okay, now you're going to locker rooms, momentum can die, you know, it's, I think stuff like that is always super interesting in, in tennis, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely special. Sports Social Podcast Network.